Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. Good evening, Fade to Black. How you doing? Today is Thursday, January 18th, 2024. Let's do this, man. I'm waiting and waiting for this show tonight. I am very excited. We have Dr. Jonathan Young back with us. And I've called this show tonight Modern Folklore. It's really well, okay. I was I was doing an overarching, just like an umbrella, you know, something that, that would catch everything. We are going to go back in history. We're gonna go to now, we're gonna take a look into the future, but we're gonna look at mythology, uh folklore. Uh, the way stories are told, uh, witnesses uh, in in ancient times that saw things and repeated, and 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 how that ties in today. We are going to cover UFOs, ET contact, disclosure, of course, ancient aliens and ancient alien theory, but how all of this ties together. And Jonathan is absolutely one of the best. He worked closely with Joseph Campbell, uh, who's best known for his work, not only with uh, comparative mythology, but The Hero with a Thousand Faces, one of the most influential books um, in the creative world in the 20th and 21st centuries. And to have that input in on this show now, I talk about Joseph Campbell all the time. I talk about Jonathan Young all the time on this show. It's because not only do I study and research the subject about ET contact and disclosure, but I've traveled the world. I have uh, been to ancient sites. I have interviewed uh, a couple of thousand people on this subject. It is where my interest lies. And I'm very excited to have Jonathan back with us. We're going to be discussing tonight, again, my favorite subjects, uh, how movies and characters in folklore are considered uh, modern mythology. We're going to jump into that. I want to get some Star Wars in tonight, too, as well. We're going to do that. E.T., UFOs, Contact Disclosure, Folklore, Mythology, Joseph Campbell, all tonight with Dr. Jonathan Young. He's a psychologist and storyteller who is frequently seen, of course, on History Channel's Ancient Aliens. Um, I think he, I'm going to ask him, my memory, and it's not the best, I think he was in episode one (laughs) of Ancient Aliens. And uh, he, uh, for several years, was the founding curator of the Joseph Campbell Archives and Library right here in Santa Barbara, California. He teaches at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, where he chaired the Mythological Studies Department. So much more about Jonathan, but I want to get straight to it. His website, folkstory.com, is below. It's also over on our website and throughout social media. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only Dr. Jonathan Young. And there hey. he is, Jonathan, young man. How you doing, sir? Hey, pretty good, Jimmy. It is nice to be back on your program. I've been on a bunch of times, but it's been a while. It, it's been a minute. It's been a minute. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know what? Here's the thing, though. I, this is where I was <laughs> thinking. It's never too late to become a rock star. <laughs> and, 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 and so for you, when all of this craziness started uh, uh, back in 2008, 2009 uh, with ancient aliens, nobody can predict the future, right? You, you just can't. And, and there you are 
Um, but you're just doing your thing on the West Coast, right? <laughs> you're running below the right. radar and, and doing your thing. And and all of a sudden, um, what was it? Did it have an impact on your personal life? or, or It's what, fun because if I'm in the supermarket, people come up and ask me about the show, which is, is fun. And I, I've been out to some of these big events they put on called Alien Con. And, and the, the, you know, the people that like the show show up and, and we have a big old time. Uh, I was working in this area that is the um, the contemporary symbolism uh, of culture that is mythology around us, not just mythology in ancient times, but how these images, these rituals, these stories infuse everyday life. The, 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 the point of meeting that really got the public's attention was Star Wars. I heard you mention that in the opening there. That was where people realized that the movies they'd been watching all along had initiatory patterns in them because uh, George Lucas did it intentionally and talked about it, said, I'm drawing on Joseph Campbell's work here. This is wisdom. This is not just entertainment. Something's in this that you should pay attention to. And and ever since then, um, you know, everybody who worked with Joseph Campbell got very busy because there was a great deal of interest, especially in Hollywood. And I do have I do work with the studios and things on movie plots and that kind of thing. But in the public in general, I think there's an awareness that was not there before Star Wars. There is a new uh, you you may have seen it. Um, It came out not a few months ago. It's a new three part docu series on industrial light and magic, and it's on the Disney Channel, on the Star Wars Channel, on their uh, app or whatever they call those streaming services mm-hmm. these days. Anyway, so uh, it's amazing, and I've watched all the documentaries on on Lucas and Star Wars, and and I, I, I can never get enough of it. But this new docu series uh, takes things a step further, and it's excellent. But Joseph Campbell is mentioned by everybody, not just George. Uh, in in all three parts, but here here was my problem. I just kept thinking of you, <laughs> <I'm just> like, <laughs> and and but the the influence. Even um, uh, I, I I just mentioned uh, the hero with the thousand faces. It's been reprinted. That's been out. I've read it. I don't know how many times. Uh, I've got my uh, very worn out copy of it. It's been reprinted so many times with different covers over the years. Right. And it's even been, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And in, in one of the covers is got uh, Luke Skywalker, you know, right. on the cover. Right. And so and it's the influence is there. And when you read. It's, it, it, yeah, it's an interesting story. I'll get into it when you, when you, when you want. But uh, how, how Lucas decided to use that model. Well, he had a crappy script, is what. Yeah. That's the story. That's, that's, that's the, the story. story. And yeah, I mean, and he had he had a, he had a vision. He had an idea for a really powerful story set in outer space that was aimed essentially for a younger audience. And he wanted to, he had a lot of wisdom. He wanted to get spirituality in there, which he called the Force. And he had great ideas, but he didn't really have a plot. And then a friend said, you know, take another look at, at Joseph Campbell because uh, Lucas had read Campbell in college. It's often assigned in freshman in English and such, but he, he wasn't thinking of it. So he went back and read Hero and some of Campbell's other works. And that gave him the, the, the whole pattern for the story, which has been repeated many times in subsequent Star Wars episodes. It's, uh, and it, it's really incredible to have uh your influence not yours uh, well your uh i'm Campbell, speaking yeah. Campbell, yeah um to to have that influence spread as quick as it did that because he he was able to see that happen and that's pretty cool uh you know during your lifetime to see that but the other part of it is and this is what is so uh, dynamic with this entire uh, story here is that it was in front of everybody the whole time, right? And you go and you and and once you read uh, a thousand faces, and you just just stop and think of anything that you thought was cool and was correct, 
That's all you got to do. It's just anything, any, anything. And it's got it. Act one, act two, act three. It's all there. But it took Joseph to, to put it all together so we could see it and then use that tool back in our own media and literature. People tend to grow up in some kind of a tradition. I grew up in a very conservative religious household. And the, the, the line you get is, this is the truth. This is the only truth. This is the right way. This is the one God, all of that. And everybody else is wrong. And what Campbell did, because he grew up a very devout Catholic, but he looked around and he said, well, wait a second. A lot of this is also in other traditions. The, the motif of a of a human that's also God that dies and then beats death. That story is retold again and again all over the planet. And it was very popular in that geographical area well before it was borrowed by the tradition we are familiar with. And so he put that all together, which really annoyed, um, you know, people that were religious leaders. They said that was, uh, in, you know, insulting, he, that he misunderstood, that they still did have the one right answer. So. People who are very serious about their spirituality found this liberating. They could look everywhere. They could see themselves in many mirrors, not just one. The hero has a thousand faces, not just one. And that really opened it up for serious seekers. And of course, it hit really big time in the 60s when people were doing drugs and stuff. And there was a lot of inner work and people going off to India. And, stuff, and they were reading that book. They were. It was like the guidebook to the inner journey. And 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 for not only uh, for good reason, but you can take those parallels. Yeah, you can put it into. You can go look at the Odyssey, right? Odyssey. You can go and do that. that that's simple, or in anything else. But how about your own life? How about the day, a, a day where you you have to leave your house? and go and get something important done, get it done, return home and have dinner. You know what? That's the hero's journey. Yeah. You know, and you can especially, put those parallels. Especially if you, have to, if you have to work through your insecurities, your fears, those are the demons. Those are the threshold guardians. And, and get it done despite yourself. Yeah, that is personal heroism. And, and we all go through it. And I think that that, that part of self-reflection, uh, coming uh, people getting that out of the book, is exactly what the book should do. And that's why people turn around and resonate with Star Wars or something like that, you know, because we all want to be Luke Skywalker, don't we? And, and right. that, well, it's Princess Leia, depending. Yeah, but the, the, we, you, you want to live a meaningful story, and that's what we're talking about here. And the transformative, illuminating dimensions of it, which were, you know, traditionally the property of religion, but it's bigger than that. It's it's deep in human psychology. We are meant to seek meaning. Yeah, that's right. And the the, the community today, uh, everybody, we're going to talk about UFOs. Don't don't you worry. That's the plan today. But but the the conscious community that you and I are a part of, and it's a wonderful community. But they are all here. On their own journey, their at their their personal reasons have drawn them to this community to seek answers, and that's the yes. other part of this. And yeah, it's it, I hate it. No, hates a wrong. It hates too strong of a word, but it, it's the inner work. It's the yeah. inner work. Well, you know, it, it kind of is, but it's also life's purpose. You know, and so I think I think it's safe to say that if a person has gone to the trouble to be listening to this program right now, they are seekers. They are on the journey. It, it, it matters. Don't worry about inner work. That comes with the game, <laughs> the, and, yeah, yeah. right? Well, yeah. The, you know, I, I think the I, I like the phrase myself, but I, I would take it very broadly, not just inside ourselves. But inside what we are looking at, that is, you can look at you can look at an ordinary movie like Star Wars. You can look at, at something. You watch a Disney animated movie. I, I saw one called Coco. Uh, I rented it uh, the other day, and it's just a story. It's just an entertainment for a young audience. And there is so much profound mystical wisdom in there. So the inner life of movies 
is quite is quite a discovery when you sort of open your eyes and you say, well, what's going on here? That's about life and death. It's about family. It's about whether we live after life, whether anybody remembers us. It's big. It's philosophical. And it is also good entertainment. I watched, uh, I just watched Scorsese's new film, Killers of uh, the Flower Moon. Yeah, Killers of the Flower Moon. And it, it, it towards the end, it's three hours, right? And so it's a commitment. <laughs> anyway, towards the end of the movie, and you and I, we're in Hollywood. We study film. We study screenplays. We look at Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. We wait for the credits. We, You know, we're film fans. And um, anyway, so it's getting to the end of the third act. It's like a half hour left in the movie. <laughs> it was a half hour left, and it was still. And uh, anyway, I'm like, uh-oh, this is of mice and men, right? That's This is what's going to happen here to DiCaprio. And I was looking for the hero's journey aspect of, of, of the film. And, you know, I was waiting for the, the hero to return home. I'm, 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 meta, I'm using a strong metaphor here, but um, I wasn't comfortable with that because it took the turn and it wasn't of mice and men. I mean, it was of mice and men. It wasn't the hero's journey, which but was. There are like, other stories. Yeah. Right. You there are other stories. And, and it's a good storyteller who leads you along and you think you're in one story, then. There's this turn, this reveal, and you realize, oh no, I'm not in that story at all. This one's going to break my heart. Right, right, right. And so the the of mice and men comes in. I was like, I don't want to watch the end of this movie. I I, I don't, I don't, I don't want. I, I I don't watch movies with a dog in it for that reason. I know how it ends. Right. Okay. So anyway, uh, Scorsese went anti-hero's journey, and he didn't do, I'm not going to give the movie away, but he didn't do the Of Mice and Men ending either. It was very creative, and I got to say, I'm glad that I stuck it out, but it was uh, it was a really good story. It was really well told. Did you? Did you an, I didn't see it, no, but you're an advanced story lover. Because when when the story is doing the predictable thing and does it well, you can appreciate that. And when it takes turns you did not expect, you appreciate that. Oh, I've thrown a few shoes at my TV. Oh, for sure, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, now let's 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 turn this around uh, uh, fairly quickly here. Now that we've set the tone, I think most are familiar with the hero's journey, and uh, we don't need to. Uh, get into that. We have so much to discuss tonight. But in my opening, uh, I had mentioned I have interviewed. Well, I've interviewed you many times, but I've interviewed uh, 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 the people that know me and listen to this show. They are a step ahead of me. They know how my brain works. They they have gone along the journey with me and and how. Uh, I interview guests and what the subjects are. That's what I do. That's what, and we all do this together. Um, and part of that now, uh, not only with, you know, ancient aliens and yourself and, and that side of things is I've actually left the country. Okay. I've left the country. I've gone out and gone to these sites. Dude, I went to Puma Punku. I went oh, to okay. Puma. Yeah, 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 yeah. I went to Puma Punku. Thought about Jonathan Young the entire time I was there, but anyway, I, I, I went to Puma Punku. Um, there is something in our ancient, distant past that we don't have a clue about, and we're starting to put the pieces to the puzzle together. Is that going to freak people out if this stuff really does bubble to the surface and we start to? really understand the distant past are are we prepared as a culture as an earth uh for well, what may the the, the the wise people that came before us our ancestors knew we would need some help they left wisdom for us 
to deal with the unexpected. There are all these ghost stories and goblins and angels and all kinds of weird stuff going on in those stories that have been kicking around forever. I think, and Joseph Campbell thought, they left those stories intentionally knowing we would need them, that weird stuff would happen on our watch and it would not be the first time. Now, it takes different forms through the ages, but the basic idea of coming in touch with something that is so uncanny that you wonder if you're going crazy, that you're just dealing with something beyond your frame of reference. That has happened before we got here and will happen again. And we do well to study the old masters because there are some clues in there to what's going on. Now, let's let's stay right there for a second. Today, and you're right, today we are smarter. We've got a lot of information. We have access to things, and we have a capability now to understand more and more than we did in the distant past. But we can tie those experiences today to the facts and the things that we have learned. But thousands and thousands of years ago, you were seeing and meeting stuff for the first time. So you didn't have a frame of reference to react in a positive or negative way or, or whatever. Um, it was just a new experience. Is that how it's presented in, in ancient folklore and, and mythology? It, there doesn't well, seem to be anger there, if you know what I mean, or fear. Well, fear. Um, you know, these these are the story. The, the, the phrase is being a God fearing person. And believe me, when when an angel showed up and it challenged your reality, when Moses was talking to a burning bush that said it was God, and he said, "Take your shoes off. You're standing on sacred ground." He he's not having a good day. He's not happy about this. He's wondering if if the reality that he has known is lost forever if he will be a madman for the rest of his life. And then he gets peculiar marching orders from this voice. And, and he, then he has the job of going and explaining that to others. That's not a happy job. In fact, a lot of people don't want it, the reluctant prophet. Uh, and people in these days that have experiences and things, it's a mixed blessing. It changes you forever. It is opening to realities beyond your imagination. But then people make fun of you. It's not all good. And so, and you use Moses as an example. That's a perfect example. But it also repeated across cultures. And so how do you, when you go through those experiences, and it may be extraterrestrial, maybe something just supernatural, doesn't matter. But you label it as an angel or you label it as a spirit, or you label it as a voice, is that because you don't have a vocabulary to, to describe to others what you're experiencing? Yeah, 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 good, good, good question. You have described it well. You use what you have. You use the vocabulary you have and the frame of reference you have. If you believe in, in genies and demons and angels and things, then you use that language. If you believe in extraterrestrial visit visitors, you use that language. It's probably all the same stuff. And it probably comes from some place that we can't really imagine. I know it's easy to imagine, oh, a dif distant uh, planetary system and some kind of travel. Uh, that, to my mind, and, and I'll, I'll stake a, a position here, I don't think so. I, 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 would be, I, I would be more likely to think of a time traveler or an extra dimensional travel or something, uh, travel through the space considering the laws of physics and the amount of distance we're talking about, not, not the most likely theory. But in the end, the theory doesn't matter as much as the experience itself. Well, that changes it, life. You know, that does. But if, if, if it's time, if it's us, right? Time travelers. Right. Well, then... It's still alien. And yes. let's say, let's say, um, I was thinking about this because this point has been brought up by quite a few people uh, lately, different researchers. If, if as time travelers, if we 
have left this timeline and and earthlings and we shoot out and we're living on another planet in, in in the distant future or or in the distant past and, and come back to visit this planet as time travelers what what's the difference are yeah. we talking about metaphor? well yeah I, I i i my guess is we're talking about something that is truly beyond our grasp that we have to be humble we can spin these various guesses as long as we are honest that they're just guesses uh, but don't don't argue too fiercely about which one is better. Um, they're all probably good guesses and useful and useful. Let a thousand flowers bloom. The now, important thing is that something happens and we are affected by it. Our hearts are touched. Our lives are changed. Our eyes are opened. That is a mystical experience. That's what they used to be called. That's what the desert fathers and mothers who would go out intentionally seeking holiness in the desert. Um, you and I, by the way, have done that. We went to the contact in the desert. Anyway, uh, and then they are changed. And then the, 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 the work begins because a person who sees something extraordinary has a, has a job. Their, 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 their job then is to, to be a witness and, and help others that are seeing things and try to explain to people that haven't seen things. You, it, once something like that happens in your life, you have a job. So is, is, uh, is that the parallel with what is going on today versus, not versus, versus, is that the parallel with ancient mythology, right? It's the same thing, just on a, on a different day. That's right. That's right. That's that, it, not everybody agrees on that point, but that's, that's my best guess. That's, that's the, a certain, certain number of people. The one I admire right now is named Jeffrey Kripp Hall. K-R-I-P-A-L. He's a full professor at uh, Rice University, top university. And he thinks there have been too many sightings of all kinds for it just to be imagination. There is something to it. And he is, he is he's within serious academic circles. And he is criticized to a degree that you just can't believe. But uh, I, I think there is, especially if you start taking them as similar and not taking too much time to say, well, is a, is, is a fairy hill castle story really a story about a goblin? Is that really a story about an angel? Is that really a story about an extraterrestrial visitor? And sort of set all that aside and say there's a whole bunch of stories we can't really explain very well. And a lot of people have seen things, various things, but still seen things that the scientists cannot ratify. That's important. The uh, the idea of what is happening today in the media and and UAP reports and the government and UFO hearings and UAP hearings and the way that ancient aliens chose to tackle this subject and we're talking about two thousand nine here. Okay, we're in 2024. Um, uh, the the way when I look at it through that lens, it seemed that ancient aliens was part of laying the groundwork, but it also allowed people to open up their minds and to look at things a little bit differently through that same lens. I, I'm not too far off, am I? No, I, it was to, to give credit where it's due. It was Eric Van Donegan and his books about the chariots of the gods that that uh, ancient aliens essentially is is based on. And he's a great guy, and he he's still around and on the show. I debate with as I see him at these alien conventions, and I have slightly different points of view. And he's very tenacious about his his way of seeing it. But uh, yeah, he he did something that that shook the ground a little bit. Did That's you people did, think? Yeah, for sure. Uh, did you uh, read Chariots of the Gods uh, when it first came out? Uh, se- let's go back to 1970, 71. Where was your head at that time? Oh, yeah, I was still deep in conventional religion. Uh, so I wasn't reading things like that. Uh, it, and then, in fact, I was more in the black and white way of thinking that that was wrong. And, and uh, you know, uh, the, the Christian message was right. 
and I'm I'm proud to have dug myself out of that particular hole and see that these things have more in common than I thought at that time. That a mystical revelatory experience, something that 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 blows your mind uh, by any name, is is probably similar to other stories of having minds blown by something so far out it's hard to grasp. Miracles are miracles. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. His influence, um, you've known Eric for a long time, and uh, I, uh, this is what's interesting. We've all got our own Eric Von Daniken story, right? We do, we, do, we just do. And uh, so I thought mine was unique. All right. My mom gave me the book. She had the book in 1970, 71, 70 takes, takes me to the movies and I, and I see it in 73, I think 72, 73 anyway. Um, and then I find out through all of these interviews that I have done that everybody's got the same story. Fast forward to a couple of years ago, I get this email from Eric uh, Jimmy would like for you to be a guest on my podcast that I'm starting. And I was like, oh, right. that doesn't suck. Okay. Yeah. D just yeah, tell me. Yeah, yeah. How cool. Yeah. yeah. So he, this is his first question. He does this really cool intro and, and stuff. Um, and then he says, uh, so Jimmy, how'd you get into this? I go, you. <laughs> <laughs> a good I had, answer. Yeah, I had the opportunity to turn it around on him. And I had to be perfectly honest. But here's the thing. We've all got pretty much the same story. His influence cannot be measured. And I'm not so sure if he fully understands um, how far and wide uh, his ideas are out there. I, okay, going back to ancient times. So... In, in Chariots of uh, the Gods, in the movie, one of the most sensational parts of the film, of course, is the Nazca lines and flying over it. And that narrator, when you fly over, the, the, you know, you know, that thing's going right. on. And right, so yeah, yeah. I fly over Nazca, okay? And I spend, I spend probably 90 minutes, and I'm filming everything. I'm looking out the window, and it's exactly like the movie. In the impact, you dove the, the the size of Nazca. You think that these giant things are just down below, right? And and that's impressive. But no, this goes on for miles and miles and miles in both directions. Mountaintops lopped off, and you fly. You know, for ninety minutes. Do you know how much distance you cover in a plane in ninety minutes? Yeah. Right. That's what a, how what a great thing to get to see it up close and personal. That that is, you know, you, you're you're a true seeker to to go to all the trouble and expense to actually see it. Doesn't a thing like that change you? Doesn't that it, it, it's it, 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 it the 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 truth is that is unexplainable. You can't that that is not some easy thing to explain. Mm -hmm. When you see a line that I, I you know, okay, I'm just going to pull out a number. Let's say 20 yards wide, right? Like the, a, a freeway that goes right. straight as an arrow over the horizon right? yeah. <laughs> from yeah. a plane, right? Yeah. And it, it you you just you just yeah. can't explain that you can't. Well, I've I, only seen films, but it's extraordinary and impressive. But it's got to be exciting to see it with your own eyes. Well, what did the ancients know? And yeah. and as 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 a teacher, you know that everything is taught. Somebody teaches you, you turn around and hand off the ball. Right. And that's the way once in a while somebody thinks of something original. Okay. That happens. That happens. But, uh, but everything is taught. So, who taught those indigenous people how to do that on the Nazca Plains? And, and, and the rest of the world, too, for that matter. That's, yeah. that's the yeah. thing. Where did the information come from? 
um, uh, I, 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 my, my own journey included LSD, which is what was in the air then. I've never done ayahuasca, but I've had my experience of being in altered states and coming to some understandings and having visitations that seemed like Aztec gods, or maybe I was being the Aztec god. It was not real clear at the time. Very, very um, transformational. And, and I got interested in certain aesthetics, particularly Aztec, the, the, um, the mystical quality, especially images where the, there's small lines drawn around the characters. And having seen that, then I, I see why the art would have that, these, these states of consciousness. And like a lot of people who come back with their report, and, and the reports are all a little similar, you come back and you kind of say, oh, wow. But then you spend the next 20 years trying to figure out what oh, wow means. That is, what I just tapped into something that's beyond my culture, beyond my reality, beyond what I have been taught is everything. Um, that's, that, you know, that's going to affect you. And you have some, you have a kindred uh, connection to others who have seen things they cannot explain. There is, uh, that's such a really, that's such an excellent point. Uh, there is this one image, uh, and the Nazca Plains have literally countless, it's an infinite, thousands of glyphs. All right. It's just, it's, it's endless and it just goes everywhere. But there's this one on the side of this mountain that the locals there call the astronaut. Okay. That's their word. That's not mine. Um, but anyway, it's uh, on the side of this mountain, and it's a it's a figure waving up at the sky, right now. Mm -hmm. And it's probably I don't know a few hundred feet tall. It's hard to gauge from a plane, yeah. but it's ginormous, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Who's it waving at? Yeah, you flip that around, just like you were just saying, right? In an altered state. Um, okay, maybe the indigenous cultures were imagining waving at something in the sky and they wanted to represent. That. I could see that. I could see that. Or, <laughs> right? Or there was something in the sky to wave at. And that right. is. Right. Now, to, to, is one very philosophical thing that's a little too hard to follow is to not see things as either or. Either it's this or it's that. Things can be both at the same time. Things can have a kind of creative tension where you where you hold it. The, the ancient Greeks thought that there was an intermediate realm between fantasy and reality. There was a space in between. That's where the gods visit us, where we don't know. One thing important is to stay in a state of great humility, to be baffled, excited, but still not certain we are not certain about any of these what we know is there's more more than we have been told and more than we understand what it exactly is maybe we're not even meant to know well isn't that uh, uh going back to my point uh or question not my point i'm not smart enough to make a point my question to you earlier which is, are we prepared for these answers, right? <laughs> That's, uh, oh, yeah. Woo. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, among other things, a psychologist, and I, I do have great faith in the uh, human ability to um, deny things and defend themselves against discomfort and ignore realities and things. So uh, I think people will keep in their comfort zone and ignore important things that are right in their faces. And so... It, it has a kind of stabilizing quality, the, the intentional choosing of ignorance, plenty of that going around. But a few brave souls, including the kind that listen to this program, are curious. They say, wait, 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 wait. What was that again? Well, well that, that right there, that thing you're saying is nothing. What is that again? Because it sure looks like something to me. You're saying the, the ancients did these big carvings and they just figured it out. Wait a second. It, it, how, how, in fact, did they did do that? So, yeah, the questioning mind um, it stays open. 
how have we earth is allegedly four and a half billion years old the sun is four and a half billion years old you know the our solar system was created at the same time okay all right so let's just go with that orthodox dogma for a second and we've had maybe about two billion years of that a planet that was at the right temperature and the gases and the lava settled back down and 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 everything else and then maybe out of that we've had about a billion years of developmental time to take us through to now but our our developmental processes of the brain have also evolved okay and so for us you and i to sit and discuss these deep philosophical ideas with these crazy existential <laughs> influences coming at us that that says a lot about where we are today but did ancient man have those same deep philosophical thoughts thoughts of entropy and you know <laughs> i mean no. it, it, it did 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 the brain was it developed in our sense of being was it as complete five or ten thousand years ago as it is today? Yeah, that's a, and I, I don't uh, have an answer. I have a response. I have an opinion. I, I don't really have an informed answer to that. But it does seem when you read the ancient lore that that things are spoken of in great certainties. They don't say maybe it was an angel. They say it was an angel. They don't say you know uh, there, there there are many other possibilities and ways to look at this. There's a great certainty in the earlier perspectives, and maybe that was a way to deal with things that were very hard to deal with. I don't know. We're in a much better position now because the planet has grown smaller thanks to electronic connection. We are in each other's faces. We, we get to know other people's cultures up close and personal. And there's a whole long process where the first travelers thought that oh, all this other stuff is just hocus pocus, it's, it's all junk. And they gradually realized there's actually these incredibly rich uh, civilizations and philosophies even greater than our own. And so we, we get to know that there are truly different ways to look at things. And that shakes our certainty a little bit. That opens up the conversation and that's a good thing. And that's where we are right now. Some people don't like it because it's confusing. And they say, yeah, well, let's just get down to what it, what's the final answer? And I'm saying, not so fast. We did that already. We had final answers a thousand years ago. We're recovering from final answers. Let's not have any for a while. Let's just keep it open and see what we can put on the table. But it, it, that is exactly my point. And, and I'm not smart enough to make a point, but I'm smart enough to observe and what i have observed is when you look at and read through the ancient texts or you look at the approach to daily life whether it's ancient egypt and their type of religion or their belief systems look at the incas or the aztecs right it's just just go somewhere and just check it out obviously they had it figured out right they had deep complex thoughts they had they were looking for the meaning of life and why we are here and what happens next these are all in ancient text sanskrit it doesn't really matter where you go uh, ancient sumerian text it seemed like the uh, these i'm going to say philosophical again that these deep philosophical issues were being worked out heavy heavy thoughts and, and, and one thing fascinating is there are slight differences. Uh, they, they each uh, had their point of view. Uh, the, the Egyptians had a profound understanding of death. Uh, we're, we don't understand death. Uh, we could read uh, what they came up with and see what we think. Um, they, these, these ancient religious philosophies were grappling with the big questions. And uh, there was a time when people said, oh, well, the religions of the world are, are, are a lot alike. They're, they're all the same, just slightly different 
uh, names and, and they're really not that alike. They're really radically different from each other and they have very different rituals and ways. Now, perhaps they're all getting at some uh, similar ideas, but in ways that are so different that we can really open ourselves up, not just by reading them, which is a good start, but like you, traveling there, try to get inside it, try to let it wash over you. And, you know, some people will go to India as spiritual seekers and learn a little about the tradition and learn maybe a meditation technique or something. And if they stay long enough, they go kind of crazy because it really is another reality. It's not just another religion. It's not just another language. It's just different images. They're living in another reality. And that's a little hard for human beings to, to handle that shift. A lot of people recover from it and come back mystics, come back illuminated. But it's, it's, uh, it is a little beyond our, our human understanding that there can be truly different realities right next to each other. It, I think that that is um, uh, part of it in that if you go, and everybody should, right? Everybody, if you have the opportunity, just get out of, the, get out of your house, leave the country. Right. Just go and do it. But don't have expectations. I, I, I wouldn't go to India or. Right. Very good point. Very good point. Well, yeah. you will, despite yourself. But try, try your best not to. Yeah. 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 Don't have expectations. Just go and 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 keep your eyes open and, and learn stuff. But but don't go there because you want to be spiritually changed or you want to have a spiritual experience. You know, if you're if you want to go to Egypt or Peru or India uh, because you want to go to a temple and have your seventh chakra ignited, <laughs> you're you're going to have well, a bad experience. It's gonna, well, it's probably not going to happen on the day you expect it to, and yet and yet something like that might happen. It probably happen on the bus when you aren't thinking it was going to happen. The other thing about travel is it's uncomfortable, and that is part of the reward. It throws you out of your comfort zone. It confuses you. The buses do not arrive on time. Maybe you get a little sick from the food. Uh, people are speaking languages you don't understand. It is so disorienting if you do it right, if you really get into it. And that disorientation is philosophically useful. It's shaking off your control systems, your, your smugness, all that you know. Why travel if you're only going to hold on to what you already know? The point is to discover other worlds. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to travel. <laughs> What's the point of going to another country and, and you have granite countertops and an espresso machine? Right? Yeah. No, 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 no. That's not what you No, no. You're absolutely right. You need to get unplugged. Yeah. That disorientation that you're talking about is so valuable. And sometimes that four hour bus ride on a bumpy road through a mountain pass, and you're just like, are we ever going to get there? That's exactly what you need. Because then when you get there, your brain. <laughs> You need your eyes still vibrating when you get off the bus, right? Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Um, you know, and so you, you come home and you try to explain it, and you'll get a couple people that can kind of follow what you're saying, but some people will say, um, so you had a good time? I mean, it's really hard to explain to anybody. I People, um, because I, I did the same thing for, for years with, with guests and with interviews. So tell me, what happened? What did you, what, you know, and, and now I'm that guy, right? Okay. And people come at me. So what happened in Peru? And I'm just like, dude, um, I'm going to unpack this for years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I haven't. Yeah. I haven't even come close. Um, and it's, it's importance is you just have to go and do the experience yourself. Um, and here's the other thing though. All right, let's go back to ancient aliens for a second or, or ancient alien theory. Mm -hmm. When you go to, and it doesn't matter. Ancient aliens has a really good style of taking any point on the earth at any point in history, and just going, okay, let's let's ask some questions here. 
Yeah. Well, when you go to an ancient site, your head is clear. You look around, and hopefully you're going to go, well, I've been lied to. Right? That's it. That's, it. that's all you need. That's all you yeah. need. Yeah. And the rest of it is your journey. But you don't want things to make sense. Right. And that's that's what I that's what I find so interesting about the ancient past. Yeah, well, there's a lot made of ancient engineering. I mean, the pyramids are, are pretty impressive and, and uh the, the, I, I like being inside. There, there's like a mystical space in there. But there's a temple called Baalbek. It's in present day Lebanon. And the 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 size of the stones are bigger than the stones that built the pyramids. And you and somehow they were moved there in ancient times and you think how in the world that, that you, we would have a very hard time moving those now with all the equipment we have and, you know and you you just you just get baffled and that's a good thing it's a good thing to stagger away from some things you can see why you is know, it I, yeah go ahead go ahead no no i was going to go off to atlantis but but go ahead <laughs> the um when you go, uh, Baalbek is a is a great example, and Egypt is right in front of us. It's we know so much about it, so it's an easy reference point. But it, it, these types of megalithic structures are all over the planet, and I cannot, for the life of me, when you go to the the top of a mountain somewhere or out in the middle of the desert. And you're looking at a 50, 100 ton perfectly cut piece of granite. Pick a spot in the world. It's, it's everywhere. Yep, and you yep. look at that and you just think, that, how? Well, just something it, how, you know, how is a really good question. I'll tell you another question I'm fascinated with. Why? Why would they build the pyramids? They built them out of religious devotion. They were not slaves. The people that built the pyramids did so willingly. It was their life work. It was a tribute to their God, to their gods, plural, to their, to their sense of the sacred, the sense of mystery. And it worked. That is, they conquered time. They built a time machine, something that is still there and still awesome, as in evoking awe. So that's that's like that the why of how you know what do we build now? Well, we build the internet. We build extraordinary things, and maybe it's for money, or maybe it's for the sake of doing it. The creative impulse. There, there are old theological ideas that that the gods started the process, and then they empowered us. They gave us creativity and intuitive powers and imagination and all that so that we can go on making. And, and so that's our job. Our job is to help the gods or be partners with the creative process. That's pretty exciting. I'm fascinated with the why question. Why did they make Baalbek? I don't know, maybe just for the challenge of the thing. Maybe you, let's just do something that's just so awesome that people are gonna be looking at that long after we are dead and saying, what is this? How in the world could this have happened? You know, and, and they did it. Uh, I love the why. I love the how. But I do have an answer, though. And I'm oh, okay. pretty confident. I'm pretty confident in what I'm about to say. I don't think I'm wrong. It was easy. Oh, that's good. Yeah, it was that's easy. Yeah. I mean, we look at the complexity, the weight, the size, the engineering, the perfection. You know, we, we look at all of that. It's alignment and okay. All right. All right. But it was also easy. That's why. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? It was easy. It was easy. Yeah. When you go to. Uh, well, they say that one man's magic is another man's engineering. That is, you, you if you, if you, truly understood how something was done. I mean, try to explain the idea of images and sound going through the air and through wires and things. Try to take that to, to some village in Peru and try to explain how the internet works. It is magical. It is also for us easy. You get the right software, you push a button and you're all over the planet. Magic. 
Yeah. Yeah. I was, uh, uh, I was at 15,000 feet, right? I'm at, it's like the highest road in, in the world, right? 15,000 feet in Peru. And, and I'm here to tell you, if you're going to fake pictures of Mars, this is where you go. Cause there's nothing there, man. <laughs> there's nothing there. And, but at this, there's these vendors up there, these indigenous vendors, and they're wonderful, beautiful people with their out, you know, the, the, the colors and, and they're up there anyway. So I'm, I'm taking pictures and hanging out with these ladies and there was, it was just so much fun anyway. So I'm thinking to myself, where do they live? Cause we just took a three hour bus ride and there wasn't a house. Right. And there's nothing, there's nothing there. Okay. So I'm, that's the way my brain works. But as I'm having these strange thoughts and their disconnectedness from civilization, I, I kind of look around and I look over. So she's got the brown, the the bolo derby hat on, you know, that they wear and that they were just say. And she's on an iPhone. <laughs> And I'm like, well, there's your answer, you know, and, and it was, it was fascinating. I just, I, I, I took pictures of her and uh, yeah, I, I just had to, and watching her swipe and hang up the phone, just smooth, just, and I don't know. Well, I guess they have. I don't know. I, it was fascinating to me. Just absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. It, Here's the um, yeah. Go ahead. Oh well, my go mine. My imagination goes from your scene you just sketched out vividly there to to sci-fi stories where there's a an invisible doorway, a portal, and somehow it opens and you step into another dimension or you step into time a hundred years ago. And we love stories like that. And of course, we just let them go. Oh, it's just some story. But what if there are really portals or Maybe if you imagine something, you actually go there. Maybe the boundary between real life and dream life is an illusion. Isn't that, isn't that, okay. I mean, isn't that every culture 5,000 years ago? Right, 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 right. Pretty much every culture. How did we let that go? Yeah. How did we, how did we... In the in the rush to build the internet, and by by that I mean a two thousand year rush in the in the process of enlightenment and industrialization and scientific uh, enabling, we did lose some track of some eternal verities. This is this is true. So now we we did it. The internet is there. We can fly to the moon. We've done some of this. It is a good moment to consider reclaiming the jewels that were left by the road. Is it possible to um, is it possible to move forward without courts or accusations and 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 putting blame? Why did you keep this information from us if you knew this the entire time? Why alter textbooks? Why why do that? Or is it possible to just accept? Uh, this reality and and where we are and move forward without there having you know Salem witch trials and yeah. and finger pointing. Yeah, that's that that comes out of black and white thinking that there are good people and bad thinking. There's a right way and therefore there is a wrong way. If mm -hmm. we get a little more uh, um, general and and decide well. You know, a part of us would would have would be the people organizing the witch trial, and another part of me would be the witch uh, that I, I would identify with a whole story. Then I want to try to understand the one that gets to the margins like that. That's probably the mystic that's actually seeing something that others don't see, and the part the that that has the witch trial is 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 afraid. And I, I know I'm afraid of various things. I mean, I've been in therapy all my life. I have my my share of anxiety, so. If we can identify with the people that we have labeled bad, we probably could understand the whole dynamic better and maybe not do it again. So you, okay. So in bringing up the stone megalithic aspect of this and preserving, you know, for us and, 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 and what have that's, that's one thing. 
but the ancients were seeing something and experiencing something very, very important, and they chose to preserve it. That's what they were doing, right? They were giving us a library for the future and and text and and references. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the and Joseph Campbell says the way to read these messages that were left for us is visual. It is to understand the picture language. If you can understand the symbolism, which is visual, it's not a written. It's not written in words. It's written in pictures. So you have to use a pictorial understanding to study hieroglyphic wisdom, then you can open the door to what the ancients left to us in terms of additional realities, of virtually additional worlds, dimensions of meaning and wisdom that are more than two, more than the surface, more than what science can deal with. That's the secret. The secret is all visual. And he gave us a few tools in his book, but basically it, they're just primers. It's just starting stuff. This is where you go in your life journey is to try to decode your own story as a heroic initiatory adventure so that you can understand the larger story that we're all in together. The uh, Back to the developmental aspect, it, it's not just... Sanskrit or Sumerian text or petroglyphs in, in North America or the Aztecs and Mayans. It's not. We can go, you can go to cave systems in in Asia, in the Pacific, or Lascaux Caves in France, or I- Italy, Spain, where you can look at some of the most dynamic artwork that's ever been done. And it dates 30,000 years ago. 35,000 years ago, the developmental process and the preserving of stuff that was important for the future was was laid out uh, tens of millennia ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and we, we have their, um, th- their life work, th- their, their cultural accumulative uh, wisdom and vision in these pictures, which were in some ways, pictures of animals, sometimes people, but we can tell that they're trying to depict their gods, their their illumination, what they found in in their universe. And we do live in the same on the same planet. So whatever they discovered could be useful to us. Fortunately, some of their pictures did survive and we can study them and live with them. You know, was it Rilke? Yeah, that said Don't be too impatient with your questions. Um, The really big ones are not going to come along. The answers aren't going to be totally clear. What you should do, he said, was live with the questions. And perhaps in living with them, you would grow into some small sense of an answer. It's a sort of a philosophical poetic notion to not dominate mystery with your own intelligence, considerable that it might be. To try to say the ancient people drawing in those caves may have known something beyond what I do. They may have been onto something larger than I can grasp. Let me look at their pictures and see if it speaks to me. That's a heck of a thought experiment you just laid out there. I, I, I don't necessarily, have I gotten any answers? Have you gotten any answers? What what's to your point? I think it's more beneficial to walk away with fifty more questions. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and I'm okay with that, man. <laughs> I'm okay with that. It, it, it keeps me busy. Um, and here's uh, uh, here's the thing. Let's say like the last cow caves or the Egyptian hieroglyphs, and somebody is carving on the wall, right? And they're depicting something that is very important. They have seen something, and and they want it preserved. But that artist has got a wife in the background going, are you going to go out and, and, and get something to eat? Right, 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 right. Right? 
You've been How much is a feral paying you for this? Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. That so that artist is not going to make a mistake. That oh, artist yeah. needs to preserve exactly what it is that they are seeing. And and why are we so quick to dismiss this to imagination when it was obviously important enough then to get it yeah. done? Yeah. Although imagination itself um, uh, is worth redeeming and, and, and having some respect for in, in another sense. That is, when we're in that intermediate zone that the ancient Greeks talk about, we're, we're in the daimonic, the place between our understanding and, and pure fantasy. Um, we need imagery. And one thing that the imagination does is give us pictures, dreamlike pictures. I'm very interested in daydreams, as if they are um, the royal road to wisdom. Um, they are very much like the dreams that come at night. There is some intentionality. You can daydream about something purposely, but some of them come on their own. You just find yourself daydreaming about something. I would take that as um, a, a visionary experience. There's something beyond my understanding. It might be only be my own, own unconscious, or it might be an angel. I don't know. Something has given me this particular image at this moment. Oh, wow. Maybe it's a glimpse into another reality. Maybe it's a glimpse into another world. So, so I, I know how you're, you're saying that to, to not, not speak of such things dismissively, not throw them away as if they're junk, they may be the flowering of the human endowment. This may be the most holy creativity we are given. Here's the problem with that, and I love spirited conversation. Okay, Here's the problem with that for me, is that you and I, the rest of the world, we have the... Mars Attacks B movies of the 1950s as a reference point. Yeah, we have yeah, that great, great stuff. Yeah, but but yeah. they didn't have that reference point five or ten thousand years ago. That well, they had was, all the religious. You know that? No, no, no. They did. They had what they had were ghost stories, and and fairy stories. Um, they had all kinds of weird stuff. They had the creature from the Black Lagoon, but it was an actual creature in an actual lagoon. It wasn't just a movie. That's so, what you know, I'm the, this about. kind of this is That's yeah. We're talking about folklore here. Yeah, they had the, the the movies now. The folklore is now in movies and TV shows, but it's always been around. But the folklore is based on reality. That's that's well, my yeah. That's see, my, see, I, I I lean the other way. I I say. Let's really? take the movies seriously, particularly the B movies that have have a, a monster in them where you can see the zipper in the back of the costume. Let's right. take this as if it was a gift from the gods, because maybe it's onto something. Especially uh, Carl Jung was, was thought that that what we would call trash culture could be revelatory. He he made a whole uh, psychological study of a novel called She which is about a goddess in the jungle. And it was kind of a Edgar Rice Burroughs. It, it wasn't great literature. And he said, yeah, but look at it. It's about a goddess. It, it, it could be about an actual goddess. I know it's just pulp fiction, but look at the story here. And that, that's spinning it the other way and saying maybe the imagination put into poorly made movies is actually getting at some reality we would be wise to appreciate. Well, okay, but could a leprechaun or an ogre or the troll under the bridge actually be contact with aliens? And they didn't sure. have a way to and 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 gods of any religion. Yeah, you yeah. Now you're talking. When you get to the trolls, now you won my heart. Yes, the the the, the goblins and the trolls are the are are, are the great. Uh, couriers, the great um, uh, sacred messengers of our time, it's particularly when they show up in, you know, the American horror TV series or something like this, the spooks and the ghosts and the and and the trolls and the, and the leprechauns and the pixies and 
all the devas, all there it is, there it is, and it, it's got so many faces. It's the monster with a thousand faces, uh, just like Joseph Campbell was talking about. And, and it, now we're talking about the shadow, the, the, the part of the story that's kind of spooky. Well, you know, the more spooky it is, the more we're talking about something we don't understand that scares us. And maybe we go to the horror movie. We're not terribly, terribly scared. Oh, it was a good horror movie. We're pretty scared. Yeah. Why do we go to horror movies? Because we, we have fear and we have fear for good reasons. There really are things that go bump in the night. There really is stuff we do not understand. It is humbling. And a good horror movie is a religious experience. It says, you're not so smart, smarty pants. You don't know everything. The boogeyman could be real if you come out under the bed and bite you. Now, this leads into a joke. Can I tell the joke? On yes, your you time? Okay. Yes. It's a psychiatrist joke because I'm a psychologist. So this guy goes to a Freudian analyst for years. He's got this terrible fear that there might be monsters under his bed. And they don't get anywhere. I mean, it costs him a fortune. And he gets sick of being on the couch. And finally, the doctor and the patient agree, okay, let's give up. Let's wrap it. This isn't going anywhere. Okay. The doctor sees the patient in the supermarket two weeks later, and the guy looks great. He's never seen him looking so happy. And he goes over. He says, hey, you really look like the top, you're on the top of the world. What's going on? He says, well, I went to another psychologist, and he helped me. Um, actually, it was only one session, and I got rid of my fear of the monsters under the bed completely. Well, the psychoanalyst is crushed by this. And he says, well, what, what did he say? And the guy says, oh, he told me to cut the legs off my bed. <laughs> That's not a joke. Okay. That's not a joke. <laughs> it's That's a very a philosophical joke. story. That's, right. That's, not joke. That's not a joke. You, know, you bring up American Horror Story, and, and here is, here's the trip about that. Ryan Murphy, right? The creator. He's amazing, right? Ryan Murphy and I could not be more opposites. But here's the trip. Ryan Murphy and I went to the same high school. Okay. Ryan Murphy and I had the same friends. Ryan Murphy and I, we were a year apart in, in, in high school. Ryan, world. My, Ryan Murphy and I grew up in the same neighborhood. The same How spooky was thing. the neighborhood? That's what I want to know. We ate the same <laughs> food. American Horror Story came out of that neighborhood. You're yeah, onto I, some stuff, Jimmy. Man, I'm telling you, I, I watch, I watch American Horror Story. All of them, they're amazing. He's he's so good at what he does. Him and his partners. There's no question about it. I'm like, where's this coming from? That we went to the same everything. Right. It was like, wow, man. Yeah, he saw something in that high school that not everybody caught. I can't I can't figure it out. I can't I cannot figure okay. that part out. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's a very good question. But to, to go to, to Carl Jung's idea of the shadow, uh, that w why we, would we have uh, horror movies or horror TV shows? Why would we have scary dreams? Why do ghosts come to us? That is, people who are dead come to us. As if it's normal in our dreams, people, our parents who have been gone for a long time in some cases, this is a whole dimension of life that is important. It's not just a dream to be ignored because it's only a dream. It is part of our reality. It is part of our emotional experience of the journey. The goblins, the trolls, the leprechauns, the pixies are real, emotionally real. They are a whole dimension of our life experience to be treated with respect like any horror movie tells you do not take the monster lightly he will come and bite you he will destroy your reality take this stuff seriously go deal with the poltergeist it is an important part of your inner life and your outer life there are also monsters walking around on the planet killing people but i'm talking about the kind that go bump in the night they're worth studying in fact jung said that if you went you know for jungian treatment uh, the first long stretch would be all about your own personal shadow dimension, your own ghosts, your own goblins, your own trolls, and, and everybody's got their share. 
cut the legs off. Your bed. Yeah, cut the yeah, legs yeah. off. I love yeah. that. I love that. I, I live in. I um. I just want to say this really quick, Jonathan. Uh, in the time that, we, um, try not to move. The cable from your headset is crackling every time you move. So oh, thank you. I get excited. And move around. Yeah, for the rest of the show, you have to do this. Okay. Okay. I was frozen. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> um. Now let's go back to. I don't want to go hardcore into religion, but it is part of mythology and it's certainly part of folklore. But can we safely interchange angels with ET or God with ET and not do, do we have a completely different story? I love that you brought this up. And uh, let me update my bio. Since I, the last time I was on your wonderful show, I have taken a ministerial position. I'm now the minister at a Unitarian Universalist congregation in Goleta, which is a suburb of Santa Barbara where I live. And these people are open to that idea. And I, I get the aliens into my sermons because I think that we are dealing with, if you will, angelic visitations. We are dealing with openings to realities beyond our understanding, and that's inherently religious. That is a revelation. And the the arrival, historically, the awareness of uh, the idea of an extraterrestrial visitation is the contemporary version of angels. That is what Eric Von Donegan wrote about in the 60s and 70s, that perhaps the ancient gods were actual visitors. Well, a religious person believes they were. Now they think they came from another dimension. He thinks they might've come from, you know, the Sirius star system or something, but they came from somewhere beyond here and they came for some reason, probably with some kind of wisdom for us. How to move megalithic stones. And, and uh, that, that's that's kind of just the show off stuff. That, 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 yeah, but it, it's worth noticing. First of all, do some miracles. Even Christ did some miracles, but it's, he didn't show up to do miracles. But he did miracles to impress people to let them know, you know, I'm not just another guy here. I'm not just another rabbi. I got I, I've got something for you a little beyond that. And so here, let me turn some water into wine and bring something back from the dead. Okay, got your attention. Now listen, <laughs> there's something you should know. Uh, you know, Giorgio has said, uh, you know, I talked to him uh, a lot uh, over the last few days. Um, love that guy to death. But if you if if pop culture moves past the hair, right, that icon, right? If we go past, yeah. he's a very, very, very deep, heavy guy. I mean, his yeah. he's probably problem. informed. Yeah. Ooh, he's, man. He studied it all. Yeah. 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 And, and so, but he keeps going back to this one point, and people are refusing to let this sink in. He never said it was aliens, right? But it, that it's the knowledge that is imparted onto us. It's, it's, it's that part of it that we need to take very, very seriously and take a look at. And I would, I would argue that he's exactly right. That, that, that's the part of it, because you brought up Atlantis earlier, Jonathan. Let's go there. When we look well, at... I'll tell, you my, I'll tell you my Eric Van Donegan story. We were on, the, on a platform, and we were, the topic was Atlantis, and we were talking about the different stories and the amazing lost utopia, the whole idea of a, of a lost treasure shows up in ancient cultural studies all over the place, many different versions of the Atlantis story about something that was way beyond our, 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 our wildest imagination. And we had it, and it slipped from our grasp. And there's, there are ideas that this might have been a very large island or a continent. It might have been in the Atlantic at a certain place and various things like that. And and Eric Van Donegan studies these things, and he's got some ideas and a very specific opinion. I am more of a dreamer and a religious person, and I was saying from the platform, which really annoyed Eric, I said, you know, we might also consider that Atlantis is a place in our heart. It's a place we long for. It is this feeling that things were once better. We were closer to the gods, 
and we have somehow lost touch with something important. And he snapped at me and said, Jonathan, Atlantis is not a place in the heart. Atlantis is an actual place. And I said, you know, Eric, it's always possible it could be both at the same time. That when um uh uh I want to be very kind and and select my words very carefully here, but when he <laughs> you're not going to get him to bend. <laughs> you just can't. You can't. Do it. I've He's tried. got strong positions. Yes, I've tried. I've tried. You've tried. You can't do it. You can't do it. You're not going to do. It. But the. The idea, William Henry presents this really well, and I think he is one of the uh, uh, progenitors of, of laying this out. It certainly has been in front of us for thousands of years. Uh, William's not the first, but he's very outspoken about this. And so when you go to uh, the ancient texts that are out there, way before Plato, Okay, so I'm not talking about Plato's Atlantis. But when you go to the ancient texts, the ancient texts clearly say uh, from different cultures that uh, something happened and the survivors of that catastrophe arrived here and helped us and taught us. Right. Now, I would argue, again, that... Atlantean, right? Uh, tomato, tomato. It's 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 the same story, and so that's where I think that uh, Eric is is probably spot on the money. That the Earth is very old, and the possibility of an ancient culture predating anything that we can imagine uh, survived. And they were advanced, and they shared that knowledge, whether it was engineering or music or law or or philosophy, science, um, that, that that is the survivors of Atlantis. And I think that, you, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, intellectual history um, uh, points out that civilization does not advance in a steady line. Um, all kinds of zigzags. Things are discovered and lost and rediscovered and lost again. And we go back and go through some old texts and find, oh, wait a second, uh, they were right in 1900. The, 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 we, we, we went off on the wrong path here. So this actually is all documented within academia, how this happens. And it's also in religious writings. You've got uh, Noah and the great flood. Something was washed away, so a few survived, and we have the story after that. And th that is not unique to the Bible. That shows up in Hopi lore. That shows up in stories. Create the creation myths all over the planet have deluge or cat catastrophic destruction. And there's usually a moral story. Don't get too full of yourself. The Greeks called it hubris, which was specifically thinking you are gods. And there are some questions as we get into artificial intelligence and some of the advanced thinking right now does this crowd our moral judgment? Will we be handing our destiny over to robots as we keep developing? Oh, there's a joke. I love jokes. The joke is the boss comes in and the computer programming is staring at a monitor and there's some kind of avatar on the monitor just twiddling his thumbs. And the boss says, what's going on? You're supposed to be working in artificial intelligence. And the, 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 the programmer says, yes, but you see, the smarter we make it, the less willing he is to do our jobs. When, uh, he'll be here all week. Uh, try the veal. Try the veal. Tip the way. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that, that's why I finally, I, either I had to go do stand-up or, or that's why I became a minister because I can tell at least one joke in every sermon. Yeah, yeah. So uh, are you going to be at Sir Laughs a Lot in Gilroy? Yeah, that's right, right. That's right, right. And uh, <laughs> but, but the, the, the question, what do you think of artificial intelligence? I mean, I think we're really pushing our moral boundaries. It, well, is it is it a question of uh, an element of transhumanism or, you know, and, and what has been discussed with the singularity? And is there a point of, you know, one day we're still us, but the next day we wake up 
and we ain't us anymore. And that's 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 the part of artificial intelligence that I just think uh, we 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 shouldn't get too far ahead of, of our skis. We have an opportunity here to slow down and and study and look at uh, the ramifications and what are the the um, uh, the negative sides of this. We learned so much, didn't we? With uh, if we go back to Gutenberg. That was a that was a seminal moment in human history, right? That was a big, big, big turning point and a big deal. And we didn't learn from it. But okay, so we let we let that happen. And then mm. electricity rolls around, radio, television, war of the worlds, HG Wells. Did we learn from that? No, we didn't. We didn't. No. No, we didn't. And 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 AOL shows up and and buddy chat and the internet and did we learn from that? No. Social media happens. Twitter, right? And 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 Facebook and whatever. TikTok and and and, and did we learn from that? No. We didn't. And that was, <laughs> Now we have artificial intelligence. Our, our kids are not talking to each other. Our kids' yeah. social life and their friends exist on a phone. Did mm -hmm. we learn? No. Yeah. And now artificial intelligence is right in front of us. I got the new updates on, on Windows, right? This week they came in. And all of the artificial intelligence, except you have to click. And there it is. And and I'm just like, we 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 have an opportunity, right? Yeah. Artificial intelligence is going to be with us for the for till the end. But we yeah, have well, an every time you type in a search thing, uh it, it, it's it's processing your question and taking you to places that it didn't do 10 years ago. There's no stopping it. So we will have to learn on the fly. To see what what kind of collateral damage is done by our own cleverness, <laughs> isn't that so? If we 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 take we have the amnesia that I brought up earlier, right? The amnesia we can discuss that and we can go, yeah, okay, we forgot. We how quickly the ancient Egyptian language and the ability to read hieroglyphs disappeared. Cleopatra's mm -hmm. over. A couple of weeks later, and nobody knew anything about Egypt. And yeah. she is closer to us today as a relative than she was with Narmer and Mene that came 3,000 years before her. Right? That's 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 an amazing fact. And then just in a matter of of weeks, it was a very short time and after she died, it was uh, what who built what what are those things over there? I don't know, but they yeah. look pretty cool, huh? Yep. Yeah, we have to learn things over and over again. It is humbling how foolish we can be and the question is what what are we ignoring? What are we forgetting right now? Uh, the whole process of memory is so sketchy. That is, things come and go in and out of awareness. And um, uh, like, like uh, psychedelics, which, which changed my life, and then for 20 years were considered uh, monstrous, uh, terrible things. And then uh, some medical people realized, actually, um, there is a healing potential to this. And now things are becoming legal more, uh, and, and research is being done. And for... Uh, a time there, a valuable human technology was lost, only to be reclaimed later. So we we are aware now that there are these pendulum swings in the in the in the annals of intellectual history where th things will get hot and cold. Um, so um, all we can do, uh, uh, earnest seekers will go down and look in the in the libraries, the things that have been forgotten, for treasures that were neglected along the way isn't it man it's it's such a deep thought process but 
how quickly we went from looking for answers. I'm talking about the planet, not you and I in our community. Uh, we went from that, it, like owning a set of encyclopedias for the house was like a big deal and a goal, right? right. right. We went from that to a deep interest into the Kardashians. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the joke I like is that, that, that science and, and human history has developed the ability to give you the wisdom and culture of the ages in your hand. And what do human beings do with it? They watch kitty videos. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love those too. I, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Some of them are great. I am. Uh, so NASA. I don't know if you read this press release. And we're going to swing this right back to UFOs. NASA just beamed back via laser from light years, right? Just be uh, 20 million miles, not uh, uh, beamed back. I have the time of it. Last week, the first full frame video message all right and it came back on laser from 20 million miles away came into palomar mount wilson right the observatory right here where we live and then was yeah. beamed into jpl live it was a cat video from youtube and isn't that isn't that just? <laughs> Remember the the, the movie uh, um, uh, Contact, where 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 Jodie Foster, the character that she's playing, um, they start getting these images, and one of them is a picture of Hitler, and they get all confused. What is this? And the, the military people get all alarmed, or maybe these are dangerous people, and then. They realized, no, that that was the beginning of television broadcasting. The, the Germans in the 30s actually did the first TV, and that they're telling us something about the time gap between the broadcast and the distance we're, we're communicating. But the, the potential for misunderstanding is so enormous if you're dealing with a consciousness vastly beyond your own. Yeah, that's right. And it was the first live television broadcast. Well, that's what would have left our planet. Yeah. And that's what was received first. So instead of freaking out, right, uh, this, this yeah. you know, the swastika that was on Hitler's arm as he's speaking right. at I think, 1938 Olympics in Berlin or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, uh, it, it, now, let's stop. 1938, and here we are now. Let's divide that in half. What is the speed of light? That's where we need to be looking at. Okay, yeah. that's how far out. And, and to the, to your point, though, if we look at the last 120 years, 120 years, we're in 2024, and you cut that in half, that's 60 years. That's what we should be. It, it 60 years out, light years, right? Out. Mm -hmm. We have a collection of stars. There are thousands of them. Mm -hmm. Look at those plant. Look at those star. Look at those exoplanets. Right now in 2023 is when we should naturally expect a response. And that's where Carl Sagan got it so right. And it, it is that if we look back in mythology and, and the Bible, right, the return of Jesus, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's now. And Sitchin talked about this too as well with Nibiru and its, its relationship uh, to our solar system and its elliptical orbit. Um, are we living in those times, Jonathan? Is, is you know that that that, that movie is so old that I, I can safely give away and 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 say some spoilers because 
we think that the message is coming from someplace that's essentially 60 years out. However, once she starts to travel, it isn't distance at all. She's going down some kind of wormholes. That is, it's more like stepping into other dimensions. And then she meets them. She gets in touch, actually has contact with not little green men. They actually are able to present themselves in some form that would be user friendly to us. Their knowledge is so vastly beyond ours, they can read our mind and take a human face so as to not scare us. And we realize in that encounter how vast the distance is between us and them. But they have come to help us to tell us some things that we need to know. And that, so it's of the kindly version. We know that these encounter stories have two sort of camps. There are the kindly camp and then there's the dangerous camp. And I have a theory about that that's not particularly rocket science. That is, if a person is fearful, if they happen to already become some fearful, for perhaps from personal trauma, who knows why, they will encounter scary visitors. If a person is a happy camper and and you know not not you know somewhat uh, just joyful about life, they're going to encounter happy visitors. That there's so much psychological projection going on when we have an extraordinary experience, we're going to meet ourselves. Just like in contact, where the face is a face that is familiar to Jodie Foster's character, so we're, we're going to end up encountering our own history in our psychological projections, and and that if there's a problem, it's really a problem we brought to the table. If there's hope, it's partly because we brought hope to the table. So we need to work at ourselves if we're going to look at the stars. Well, it, okay, so. Jodie Foster goes through that entire experience in, in, and she sees it in a linear time scale, right? Walks the beach, meets her dad, does the whole thing, right? Okay. Yeah. And then when she gets back, she finds that they were like, no, you never left. Yeah, yeah. You, you only, it was, it was less than a second, right? She yeah. goes, no, that's impossible because blah, 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 blah. Right. Uh, da, 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 da. No, that's that's it. she had that entire. Isn't that what happens, Jonathan, when we dream? Because oh, when yeah, we, that's good. Yeah, 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 when we dream, I had a dream. I'm not gonna. I hate it when people tell dream stories. Yeah, about yeah, yeah. hate. Don't tell me about your dreams. Don't. I. I don't yeah. need it. But here's here's what's interesting. I had a dream. And I remember all of it where I wrote a book and I wrote it I page for page for page and the thing, da, 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 da. how long does it take to write a book? Well, I yeah. can tell you this, I wrote the book and it's still here in a dream. Now, how is that possible? Yeah. yeah. I That's was only a very good point. Yeah. The I was time only distortion. Right, right. I was asleep yeah. for six hours. Yeah. But well, not I, nearly long enough. In fact, sometimes you can have a dream where uh, I have a little button on my clock so I get another 10 minutes. And then sometimes I'll have this dream that goes on. Clearly what happens in the dream would take days for this thing to transpire. And then I wake up 10 minutes later, letting us know that time is not as orderly as the clocks suggest. It folds, it stretches, it cracks. It, there, there are things that can happen in a millisecond that will change our lives forever. We can see the eternity in a grain of sand. It, it, that's very humbling. It gets kind of poetic and philosophical, but not to be too sure of the reality that our culture has given us. Isn't that Jodie Foster's experience? Now, isn't that a wisdom text? Isn't that a Bible of sorts? That movie, that novel, that that vision that's just telling us, be humble. There are things you do not understand. And some of them are good. That is extraordinary wonders that could happen in our lives. If it can happen in this novel, in this movie, it could happen in your imagination. It could happen in your life. Isn't that, again, going back to what the, you know, the ancients knew, is the dream state 
not inside of our heads, and it very well may be, but is it access to that parallel world that physics is trying to teach us today and trying to force us, I should say, to understand the the idea of the multiverse and quantum realities and parallel and uh, 11 dimensions and, and quantum computers and qubits yeah. is, is that something? Yeah, I will. I will. Uh, I will tie several things together that there is something about quantum physics that is parallel to what happens in dreams and that people who have intense, vivid dream experiences know that something is more than just a little brain energy there. You're tapping into some kind of reality. There is something about visitations we cannot understand. And the pattern of visitations goes back long before there was ever an imaginary spacecraft. So we have sacred chariots flying around. We have abductions by Native Americans or deep in Africa or off in India where somebody is disappears for a while and they come back with strange tattoos and they've had unusual experiences. We, we have all kinds of encounters with magical creatures that live in fairy castles. These various anomalous experiences match each other. There are patterns in all these stories that are similar to each other where we are stumbling into something that we did not think was possible and are meant to learn something from it. So to study uh, UAP, to study the extraordinary possibility of visitation, or to study fairy tales have a lot in common. Those parallels, okay, if we stay right there, are we supposed to understand our dreams? In other words, the, the dream state, I should say, not not our dreams, the dream state, that somebody explaining us the process of that is is not fair. We shouldn't listen. In that there are no experts any more than there are experts into uh, quantum realms or or anything else that we have clearly no understanding on, but those experiences are are our own, right? Well, I would not go quite. I wouldn't quite go quite that far, but I, I would. I would go with the spirit of that. To be very cautious about reading a dream book that says, "Well, this always means that." No, it right. doesn't. It means different things to different people. Uh, to take even our own guesses lightly. Yeah, I think it means that today. But if I bring this dream up again a year from now, I might it might mean something different. This is all very tentative. And if somebody's a guide, if you get to a good therapist who's good with dreams, they can be helpful at times. And then every now and then they can make such a wrong guess. And maybe they're really sure of themselves, in which case it's time to get a different therapist. But I, I think sometimes guides can be helpful, but I... I I agree with the spirit of the thing. Be a little cautious about that sort of thing. Well, it's the same thing with consciousness. It's no different. You can't. I'll ask you. Consciousness. Is it of the physical or the non-physical? Remember what I keep saying about the Greek culture and they thought there was this place in between. That's where I'm drawn. That's where enlightenment happens. That's what they thought. I tend to agree. And they had these characters. Now, characters in mythology and folklore are imaginary. They're, they're personifications of ideas or energies or something. And these, these guides, we could call them genie or a, a daimon or angels or these various names. Some are considered more difficult or shadowy. Some are considered pure light but they will help guide us through this intermediate zone. That's where the anomalous wisdom lies, and that's where I am fascinated. But should we listen to somebody's opinion about consciousness? Like a physicist. What, what does a physicist know about consciousness aside from the ability to laugh, smell, taste, and cry, and think, right? I'm but not very, yeah. 
No, back to back to your point, which was a very good point. Is it is it about physical reality or is it something else? Um, I am not very attracted to the theories that will explain uh, things as mysterious as consciousness in physical terms. I think they're on the wrong track. I probably mean well and intend to be helpful, but I think poetry is more helpful. Science fiction movies, even if they're badly made, are more helpful in understanding the mysteries than most physicists. But I'm not against physics. It has its place, but it doesn't explain a thing like this. It can't explain what a dream's all about. In fact, I read something where they were trying to explain dreams as the brain's uh, need to ex discharge excess energy at night so that you could relax. I'm thinking, okay, well, you completely missed the point. That might even be physically accurate, but you missed the point. The visionaries of the ages have had powerful dreams. It's something more than a brain fart. Right. And, and, and physicists, um, as they get older, get much more philosophical. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. It's more poetic, too, yeah. Yeah, very poetic, very poetic. Well, and there are some things, if you think about it in religious terms, if you think about the size of the universe, if you think about the distances, you th this is like metaphysical. This is like a, a mind-bending number when you start imagining, or you go out like you did to a, the highest place on the planet, or go out to the night of the desert and see the additional stars that we rarely glimpse. And this can be... Uh, an epiphany. You, you you can have a revelation seeing a thing like this, and it's pure physics. Well, it it, it, it kind of goes both ways. It's going back to that Greek uh, in between situation, where you can look at spiritual uh, leaders like I'll just say the Dalai Lama, you know, as an example. Um, whereas they get older they also look to the opposite side of the fence where they're looking at science and they're studying more about that because they need the clear understanding of why consciousness and spirituality does what it does. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that the two need to meet in the middle and the Greeks laid yeah. it out for us, didn't they? Yeah, and I think that uh, any given uh, uh, seeker, any earnest person who is being thoughtful about all this doesn't have to be good at all of it. I, I'm not very good at physics. I mean, they, they, people try to start explaining the origins of the universe, and I can sort of follow them for a couple of minutes, then I'm lost. And I'm a smart guy. I, I have studied a lot of things, and I have to realize, okay, I've got my little bite of understanding. I am not going to comment on whether a physicist has got it right or not. I don't have time to read all the books I'd need to make an intelligent comment about that. I'll just say, okay, I guess you're right. I'll never know. Well, it's okay. So wouldn't it be the same truth as a physicist that they don't, they, they can't make, uh, they can't develop uh, an opinion on consciousness because they haven't spent any time with it. They're too yeah. busy with black and white and numbers. Yeah, an interesting historical note. Uh, every now and then Einstein would make a, a kind of general statement that wasn't part of his theory. And he would say, uh, God does not play dice with the universe. And an important theologian, I do not remember who now, said, with all due respect, how would Einstein know? He has not spent his life studying theology. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He knows things about physics, but don't, don't use that word if you don't understand the word. And this is Einstein he was talking about, you know, one of the smartest people in the history of people. Uh, there it is. Uh, we, you, you, sometimes you'll get somebody who won a Nobel Prize in some field making comments about something else. It's just not their area. Stick to what you know. I, I um, whenever I deal with, and you do this uh, as well, um, when, when I'm asked to do something on film or television and, you know, 
expert or as a, you know, yeah. I, I, I do, I stay in my zone. Yeah. Don't yeah. ask me to step outside of my playing field. I, I won't do it. I'm not, I'm, I'm just yeah. not going to do it. I, I, I can't and I won't. But it, which, which brings us to, I want to stay uh, in the spiritual consciousness aspect of this because, and Einstein, yeah. 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 in that some things have been steadfast over the last hundred years. And one of them, based on um, Einstein, uh, both as special and general, is the origin of the universe and that time scale and backing mm -hmm. up. Uh, and when I say backing up uh, in a time scale, his equations have taken us back to 13.8 billion years. And then that was the big bang. The, the math gets a little fuzzy once you get to a certain point, but we're talking about, trillionths of a second right that's where the math gets really fuzzy but uh -huh. and, and so everything that part of science has been pretty solid now all of the sudden today the discussion is going on that the big bang may not have happened that maybe it just was and mm -hmm. maybe that's there was yeah, there's not a 13.8 billion anything that we were already here. And that is crazy talk, but yeah. it also feels spiritual to me. Right? It does. I'm, I'm completely out of my depth, so I have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, I hear you, uh, but yes, I'm, I am in the end more interested in the spirit. That's where you get back to mythology and the old spiritual stories that explain things in ways that are you know, catchy stories, memorable stories. They don't try to explain the exact math. Both projects are probably worth our time to not dismiss either one as, you know, as all right or all wrong. And then now and then they, they agree with each other, which is sort of fascinating. It, wouldn't it just be, there are, you can laugh too. It's okay. There are some pretty pompous atheists out there, right? And, and there are also some pretty pompous believers, yes, but the pomposity gets around. Yes, 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 yes it does. And that just, you know, that that they know everything. You know, and, and and this is the way that yeah, it is. There, well, there's an the interesting develop. There's an interesting theory about this. It's called stages of faith, and it's a theological notion built on developmental psychology. That at a certain stage of consciousness, certain stage of learning, we we get to an understanding that seems like a final answer, and we pronounce that we have the final answer. And then we live another 20 years and we grow out of that ignorance and realize, oh, actually, there are many final answers. Oh, I didn't think that 20 years ago. Now, it's not that the person was being pompous or dishonest. They were just limited. And later, they get a bigger picture and they have to correct themselves. So, um, it, oh, but they only do that if they're relatively honest souls. Some people will stick to the dumb thing they said years ago. You know what I need to do? I need to I need to come up and have some pea soup and hang out in one of your classes. There you go. Well, you know, I, I mentioned being a minister now, so and I, I, I'm, I'm, when we put our services on and my my sermons and things are on. That's a different website, but they can find it on my website, which you say is on the screen folkstory.com yeah. and there's a note in there about where if you want to see my videos and things but i'm having a big time this is new for me because i've been a professor all my life and i got invited to take this pulpit and to weave the kind of things that you and i talk about into sermons has been a kind of a, a new adventure in my old age i you know jonathan just don't stop man it, uh, like i okay. said it's never too late to become a rock star <laughs> That's a great line. <laughs>
Jonathan, you, you're the guy with the guitars behind you, so rock on, Jimmy. Hey man, hey man. You know, I, I didn't. Uh, yeah, this is this is my world for sure. Um, but uh, people like you and myself, we have uh, life's experiences behind us that allow us to push forward and to share our information. And don't ever stop doing that, man. Um, right. I just. I've, I've just got so much respect for you, Jonathan. Thank you so much. And let's not wait forever to get you back All on right. the show very soon. Thank All you. right. Thanks for having me back. Great to see you. You're the best, Jonathan. Thank you so much, my friend. Folkstory.com. Yeah, the links are below. We've got them over on our website and throughout social media. And that's going to wrap up our week here on Fade to Black. And I want everybody to just go and enjoy and have a fun, safe, uh, amazing weekend. It is in front of us. All right. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. That was a perfect show tonight. So much so that I blew through the commercial. I just did, but that's the way it is. Fade to Black is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee Newman, and Michelle Freed. Thank you to Bill. Thank you, John Side. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. And this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. Our meal is Jimmy Church. I'll see everybody on Monday. Until then, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.